Hello, my name is Ken, and I want to welcome you back to my podcast, Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strengths Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the absolute awesomeness and plan of God that He is expecting from His church. Well, welcome to episode number five. This is 507, and it's my first series, and I'm hoping you're enjoying it. So this, yes, this is a Christianity you should be being taught. Not only being taught, but also being shown how to apply these things to your life. I'm not preaching, so let's get teaching. So the first word in this message is purity. In Proverbs 22.11, it states, He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. In 2 Corinthians 6.6, it states, By purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. Well, I know the scripture seems a little out of context as I only included verse 6, but look at the language that describes us as believers by and by. Let's be all of it. In 1 Timothy 4.12 it states, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers, in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So we have by and by and in and in. I believe the other descriptors help us to understand how to walk in purity. You can see how Paul affected Timothy as they both speak nearly the same language when talking about purity. This is how you bear fruit that remains. This is how you equip the saints for the work of ministry. Paul left us a good example in Timothy. So in 1 Timothy 5, 1-3 it states, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as others. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters with all purity. Okay, so that didn't make the journey easier, but it did make it holier. We have our work cut out for us, don't we? But so does he. I have stated this before, but is it any wonder how we can find time to finger point when we have so much process to go through? And this, while we are being made a disciple and making disciples, and while we are equipping the saints for the work of ministry, and actually working in the ministry, The whole church would strengthen up overnight if we refocused on what is really important. Right, right, right? Our next word is, you guessed it, righteousness. So righteousness doesn't mean that you will always be right. But it does. And I know that you can hardly contain yourselves, meaning that we have another layer to deal with. Sounds like we are onions. Maybe we are just big human onions. But moving away from that, think about these things for a minute. Perfection, sinless, purity, righteousness blameless and holiness. So without God in your life performing the miracle of miracles on your very being, just how good do you think you are? Look at these words, these actionable words. They are to be the new descriptors of our life on planet earth, not just in heaven. Yes, right now, right now. Let's continue to sort the matter out, shall we? In Matthew thirteen seventeen, it states, for surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Matthew thirteen forty three goes on to say, Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In Matthew twenty five thirty seven it goes on to say, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? Same chapter, verse forty six. And these will go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So it sounds like being righteous is the key to getting into heaven. In Luke 1, 6, it states, And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Blameless. There's some more keys, isn't there? Blameless also has to do with it, but also walking in the commandments. John seven twenty four. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. I can't tell you how many times I hear Christians say, Don't judge me. And yet here it says right here, Judge with righteous judgment. This is the only way that we can be helped. If we can't take criticism, if we can't have anybody speaking into our life to help us to become better, we are in trouble. Romans 4, 5 states, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Romans four eleven states, And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he has, while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Romans 4.13 states, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
In Romans 5.17 it states, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, that is Adam, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. In Romans 5.19 we finish with, For as one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Again, talking about Adam. So also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous, that is Jesus In this, it is important to see that obedience can make one righteous, his deeds righteous. But glory be to God, we are not left to ourselves to do it alone, because what Jesus did at the cross, when received by us and birthed in us through someone preaching the word into the very souls that have the seed of God, lying dormant in them, so that they would be authentically born again and made righteous, was and is by far the most significant event to have ever been recorded, ever, ever, ever. In Romans 6.16, it states, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So when you listen to God, when you follow his commandments, when you listen to those who he's placed in authority over your life, it leads to righteousness. And when you don't, it leads to death. In this we see it again, obedience. Now you see why it is imperative that we know God and hear his voice. Elsewise, how do you end up where Jesus is at in that moment of time? He prayed to the Father that you would be where he is at, John 17. Not to depart from this field of discussion, but I truly am always looking to help. Look at Second Thessalonians verse 8 for a minute. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd recommend reading the whole chapter, but basically the point is made, obedience and knowing God. Know him and obey him. Is there anything so important in these two? Nope. Perfection, sinless, purity, righteousness, blameless, and holy are byproducts of knowing him and obeying him. They are not our primary objective. They are as a result of getting to know him and obeying him. What in the wide, wide world of sports did you just say, Ken? In this entire message, we have been going through the attributes of what a believer should be daily operating in. I am saying that we have our hope in his glory to know that he did not leave it up to us alone to develop and walk in these Christian descriptors. The power of obeying God is almost unimaginable as to how it can so change you. Now to creep up into the paragraph where I asked, is there anything so important in these two? I know we have commandments to follow. Let's take a look. In Luke 10, 27, it states, So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. By the way, if you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. John thirteen thirty four says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. When I hear about Christians not getting along with other Christians, this concerns me. My thought is that as we get to know God and obey Him, or as we get to know Him, we will, out of that relationship, be ever so inclined to do so. Then we will effectively do as Luke and John have stated above. Trying to love people without getting to know the God of love Seems a bit like trying to drive to L.A. in a car with no gas. Look at the power of the love of God, and then we will get back to the primary message. By the way, I live in paradise. We're talking about 550 miles. So in 1 John 2, 5, it states, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. In John 3, 10, it states, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his brother. I told you it concerns me when I see Christians not getting along. And you didn't let that other thing kind of slip by, did you? Children of the devil. We have talked about it before and have other messages on it. Yes, God has children and so does the devil. Okay, so you don't love a brother from a different mother? Then according to John, you are not even of God. I would drop the mic, but the statement is too shocking. I know that one of the primary frontline battles is to pit Christian against Christian if for no other reason than to create confusion, but also to turn others away from the gospel and ultimately from God. In 1 John 4, 7, it states, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In 1 John 4, 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So it says here, If we don't love, we're not from God, nor do we know God. And I just read out of Thessalonians that he's coming back for those that don't know him. Matthew 20:28 20, states, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So it's also important to know that loving others is not just walking in empathy and compassion. It is ultimately serving others. And to the degree that you do this, 
is to the degree that you connect with God, the God called love. And I say this because Jesus said it. Look, in Mark 9, 35, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. I've said it once and I'll say it again. Love is actually serving. And when you see love in the context in the Bible and how it's used throughout the Bible, you will see that uh, a person who loves is a person who serves. This is why it's important that you serve in the church. It is an expression of God's love to others. Can't get away with saying that God doesn't want us to serve in his church. If you're a church hopper or noncommittal or rebellious towards church leadership and stand against anyone Christian having authority over you, then perhaps you should take the mic and instead of dropping it, just bong yourself in the head until your mind transforms. Just do it in love. <laughs> First John 4.10 And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent a son to be the appropriation for our sins. In 1 John 4.16 it states, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. In John 4.20, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? In John 5.1 it states, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. And in John 5, 3, it states, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So there it is. Love equals keeping his commandments. Keeping his commandments becomes our desire as we get to know him. And ultimately, the expression of love is serving others. So back to the primary message. We left off at hearing him. Some of you may very well say that it is fine and dandy when I hear his voice, and I will do what he tells me to do when I hear it. Yep, nope. I have heard this many times before as I watched the poor soul dry up right in front of me. A branch removed from the vine, and it was their own doing, and it leads to their undoing. What say you, Kenneth? God speaks primarily through his word, his Holy Spirit, and the people in whom he places in the fivefold ministry to equip you for the work of ministry or other leaders in the church. I've had so many conversations with other believers regarding honoring and obeying church leadership. To the point that some became very contentious about the whole subject of honoring those who have been placed in a position of authority over their life. We who have been around a while call it coming under leadership, obeying God. God calls it submitting and obedience, which if done, will lead to your knowing him more. To get clear on this, please read Numbers chapter 12 and 16, and then tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, you say that that's the Old Testament and it doesn't apply to believers today. No problem, you're wrong. Grab the mic, bonk yourself in the head again, and let's learn. But let's go on to the Jesus books and see what he said about authority and obedience. Now we're in the New Testament. Hebrews thirteen seventeen states, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. In Acts five thirty two it states, And we are his witness to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Don't obey God? No Holy Spirit, no Holy Spirit, no supernatural signs and wonders, no supernatural signs and wonders, no gospel and power. I know, it's a chain of events that's not good. First Peter four seventeen, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Yes, you can be a believer and totally out of the will of God, just by not obeying. I'm telling you, rebellion is a massive Massive issue in our church. First Peter two thirteen seventeen. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, that's lowercase king, or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. You see where it says honor all people? All people. Honor the king. That's lowercase king. Romans thirteen one seven. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. There's that word judgment again. There's going to be judgment in your life as a Christian. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. 
Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. Be very, very afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Listen to me, taxes are not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that there's people taking advantage of the situation, but it doesn't give you permission to do so as well. Pay your taxes because it has something to do with you and your relationship with God. So look at what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 9-10. through 10. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. They despise authority. If you are a believer and you have a problem with authority, you better talk to Peter. He's got something to share with you. Okay, Ken, that's wild. Are you saying that if I'm unwilling to listen to my church leadership, that I'm despising authority? You said it. Well, I didn't, but I did for you. But I didn't say to you that Peter did. Now, let me clear something up that is smoking up my view to press on into this message. I am not saying that you should not listen to other Christians. Look into the natural for a minute. You have two parents in a perfect world. Well, maybe not perfect. And they are the bosses of you, right? But if you have older brothers and sisters, you can listen to them as well, as long as they don't contradict what the bosses are saying. Some of you with timeout knees syndrome (laughs) know what I'm saying. Look again, we have police who enforce laws that they did not create. They didn't write them. It has to be this way to ensure law and order prevail. I know some church leaders have failed greatly and in some cases have all but destroyed some sheep in doing so. But this does not change the scripture. You can challenge a call they make, and in some cases you should, but there is a proper way of doing that. So do it properly. At least God corrects you in the same manner you have corrected them. You know, when Jesus said, hey, take the log out of your eye before you look at the sliver in somebody else's, you know, it never changes perspective. You're always going to have a lot of stuff you need to work on, so never mind the other person. Now, this is different than judging a person and righteousness, as we've already stated. Hey, Ken, I thought this section was about righteousness. Yep, good on you. But I included a toolbox of how to develop righteousness and remain in it. Listening to the natural leaders, as many of the above scriptures are talking about, is how we come away with the concept that we truly need to listen to our church leaders. Again, there are ways to deal with the wayward, and if you choose to do so, tread carefully and follow King David's example insofar as how he treated Saul. Well, that's it for today. Wow, there's so much to being a crib baby, isn't there? You see, it wasn't enough to just fall out of your heavenly crib and land on this planet. Daddy had some grace and mercy loaded expectations for what we do and how we act. Stay tuned for episode 6. We'll fortunately not be the end of this message journey. We'll have one more after that. Remember, it's not what you find wrong or disagree with regarding the message, but what you can take away from it. Together we can do more to impact the kingdom of God than if we worked alone. Let's flip the script and kill, steal, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of light to shine through into people's lives. Plant a seed and click on the like and subscribe button. Let's build this ministry together. Thanks and see you next time in deep water.